The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. On today's show, I've got Carly Barton. Carly is a leading patient advocate and probably very familiar to many listeners. She works with a ton of different organizations, very busy lady. It's been very hard to <laughs> pin her down and get this into <laughs> so I'm really, really pleased. Carly is at the forefront of patient access and advocacy in the UK and really understands the systemic issues and barriers to more patients getting cannabis. So it will be great to chat to her more about what's going on and how we can change things. Welcome, Carly. Hello, finally. I don't know how long we've been trying to have this chat. <laughs> um, and I do yeah. apologize, but it's lovely. Definitely, to definitely worth the wait. Definitely worth the wait. And I'm really glad to, to have you here. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm all right, actually. Yeah, actually, pain's quite low, quite well medicated. So so things are all right today. Sun's out in Brighton. Yes, good to hear, good to hear. Cool. Well, I mean, there's loads of stuff to talk about and you are really getting out there and doing so many things. Maybe before we kind of get on to what you're doing currently, it might be useful for people to understand you know, how you came to be such a big proponent and advocate of cannabis as a medicine. Yeah, I just think I always think that this is strange because if you if if I would have said to me five years ago or six years ago before I got into this game that I was going to be a cannabis advocate, I, I just I just wouldn't they just wouldn't have believed you at all. It would have been a completely ridiculous notion. But for some for some reason, I found myself here. So I guess I started utilizing cannabis for neuropathic pain following a stroke when I was twenty four which just happened out the blue. Uh, I was just on the couch with my other half one day and, you know, it just sort of happened. I do have a history of of blood bleeding disorder. So there was sort of like a risk factor for me having a stroke anyway, but it's sort of the thing that you don't really expect to happen when you're 24 and just... You've been so young, yeah. Chilling out with a Chinese, watching telly on like a Tuesday night. It's not really, uh, you know, it's anyway. So yeah, so that happened and I, um, following that, stroke I was diagnosed with some damage to my brain to my central nervous system which meant that I was in like near on constant neuropathic pain. So Um, would you really mind um, explaining what exactly neuropathic pain is? Yeah so basically one you know when you've had a stroke or there's been any damage to your brain or your brain chemicals are depleted slightly there's been there's been an incident the sort of the, the nerve sort of if you can imagine it like a um like an electric cable that's got like a, you know, like a rubber casing around it. If you can imagine that that is your nerve, but basically all that happens is that, you know, the, the casing sort of wears away, it isn't there. It's not protected by the sheath that usually keeps all of the nerves sort of in line. So with that exposed, just like you would with a, um, with an electrical cable, if you touched it, it, it was live, it would sort of fire off and shock. And that's sort of what happens in my brain is that the, the sort of protective sheath isn't really operating properly and so my brain misfires these pain signals around my body so I always say to people it's like if I hit you with a hammer you'd only feel it because the the signals in your brain has sent the sent the pain signals to that part of your body and it's communicated back to say that hurts Mm -hmm. whereas my brain sort of miss my brain sends those signals all the time despite the fact that nobody's hitting me with a hammer right right so that's the kind of thing that's the kind of way I, I tend to explain it to people yeah. But you know, follow you know, following that I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is really really quite a common and prolific in women actually condition which is ex- was exacerbated or caused by the the damage to my brain. And that, you know, that has a massive sort of myriad of symptoms that are, you know, every every symptom that you could ever imagine, sleep, problems with sleep, problems with speech, problems with communicating, problems with muscle spasms, all kinds of stuff. It's all mm. sort of it's very clumped fibromyalgia as a diagnosis. Mm. So I was sort of dealing with those two things in combination. Um, um, sorry, fibromyalgia, is it an inflammation issue? The thing, the thing that they that they don't really know, they don't really know what's going on. They, they've been able to see in that the brain isn't functioning properly in patients with fibromyalgia, and that pain signals are happening without pain signals throughout the body 
are heightened. So something that might not hurt you, like from a sensory perspective, things that might not hurt you are like the lights in Sainsbury's. But I, you know, I've just had my shopping delivered because I can't go to Sainsbury's because the lights in those big shops will sent, mean that I'm in agony. Really? Wow. So it's like, it, it, you know, there's a communication issue really with the brain, yeah. essentially is what fibromyalgia is. And that's why the, the symptoms are so significant and, and lengthy. And they don't, and they don't know. There is some inflammation that happens in patients with fibromyalgia. Generally, it's more nerve related and and sort of central sensitivity, which is which means that the brain is interpreting things incorrectly. So that's why a lot of patients with fibromyalgia tend to go when when we're talking cannabis, they tend to go with THC or THC in combination with CBD rather than CBD alone, because we're not talking about just inflammation. We're not talking about a you know a problem with flaring inflammation markers we're talking about a communication issue with the brain and to do that you need to cross the blood brain barrier in the brain uh, and target those areas to sort of calm down the central nervous system so yeah so i was diagnosed with with those things and that happened and it was all a bit crap and obviously i, I went down you know t- to the hospital because that's sort of where you go when you have a stroke um, <laughs> and so i was put in touch with specialists and GPs and, you know, they said there's nothing we can do. You know, there's, there's damage there. My language was affected. The fact that I can come and speak on this podcast now, that wouldn't have happened six years ago because I would, I would have been struggling to the point of not being able to communicate or find words or find language because it was quite significant, the trauma to, to the brain. So, yeah, so, you know, I went and followed doctor's advice. I took their anti-neuropathic drugs. I took all of their, you know, uh, benzodiazepines, their sleeping tablets. Um, They started me on opiates, which is quite a common story, really, like uh, cocodamol, tremadol. When that stopped working, they just, it just ramped up and up and up and up to the point where I was taking fentanyl, which is 50 times stronger than street heroin. And it's delivered via a transdermal patch on the skin. So it's constantly being pumped into your skin 24 hours a day. Mm. And when that didn't work, they gave me morphine on top to combat the breakthrough pain. Um, so, you know, I was in my 20s and my pain was unmanaged. These these opiates were just absolutely killing any sort of a connection I had to the world or to my emotions or to my family or my friends or anything I loved doing. I was mm. just a shell really and the pain was was still unmanaged i sort of reached the limit of where western medicine could take me i guess and i think i sort of had to get there i had sort of had to get that low and i began you know googling end of life clinics because i couldn't could i just could not imagine having to live the rest of my life in that amount of pain every day mm. And it wasn't just that, it was, it was you know, the impact on family and people having to care for me and, you know, people having to cut up my food. It was, you know, in my, I, I'm, I'm a stubborn, independent bugger. And, um, and so for me, that was really difficult. I think emotionally having to deal with being looked after was, was you know, really horrible. Mm. So I started to look at other options and a few friends had said, you know, cannabis is supposed to be good for pain. And I was kind of like, mm, so, sort of something you do when you're 13. But also I'm really low at the minute and I don't really want anything that is going to impact me mood wise because I was really struggling. And I was like, I don't want anything that's going to send me wacky. Mm-hmm. So I avoided the wacky backy mm. for a while mm. um, until I had what I, you know, what I would say was a fuck it moment. I'd been in agony for days. Nothing was touching it. I was well grumpy. And uh, I just went outside and made a joint and smoked a joint because a friend had, had left me with some for, the, for my fuck mm. it moment, which I'm very <laughs> grateful for. And it was some homegrown, you know, homegrown hybrid. I, I smoked it and I went up to bed and... I vividly remember going into the bedroom and my other half started taking the, taking the mick immediately because she knew it was this joint. So she started, you know, just ribbing me about having the munchies and, you know, just, just taking the yeah, mick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. She was pulling them all out of the bag. And she said, you know, I said, <laughs> she was asking me how I felt. And I said, you know, I don't really feel that different, but I feel like something's missing. I was and it's kind of like that feeling, you know, when you had your phone 
a minute ago and now you can't find your phone and you tap in all of your pocket, you know, and you, you end up in that like, oh, something's gone, something's missing. Yeah. It's kind of like that feeling. I said, I feel like something's missing. And she was laughing, just thinking, oh, you know, she's she's baked. <laughs> <laughs> What's she missing? Like, what she she's probably lost something because she's so baked, but I wasn't. And I realized that I the thing that I was missing was pain. I couldn't feel any pain in my body. And that was just like mind-blowing stuff to me because for six years I'd been on these really heavy toxic drugs and still I was in a, I was in so much pain that I could constantly feel it in my body. And so mm. pain-free was like this weird, I was in such a weird state with it. It felt really bizarre. That's so weird that you characterize it as like you were missing it. Like it yeah. became part of you. <laughs> it, was hard. it totally had. It was kind of like, oh, it's kind of like my ear or something, you know, like something that you would miss. It's like an organ because you are with chronic pain you're carting it around 24 7 and it yeah. and it does become quite a part of you know your identity it's something that you can't ignore so yeah it, it felt like a lack of something but it was the the best thing I've, I'd ever lost and so you know so then sort of started a journey of working out okay so everything that we've been told I've been told about pain management and western medicine is pretty much bollocks mm-hmm. and this is something that really works for me. So I started, you know, in true Carly fashion, I don't do anything by halves. <laughs> then started experimenting with as much cannabis as humanly possible in every kind of a way. You know, I haven't stuck it in my eye yet, but if I could, I probably would. But, you know, every kind of consumption method, every kind of strain, every kind of cannabinoid ratio, everything and then sort of tracked it to see what my body was responding best to because I really wanted to understand it more and to understand why some strains had a really incredible impact on my nerve pain but were crap for my uh, spasticity or vice versa so I really wanted to get into the nitty-gritty of what it was that worked for me which was to be honest was was a lot of fun as well as being really interesting and really eye-opening and then I sort of started helping out with the United Patients Alliance. So before we, you know, before the law change, uh, there was a lot of campaigning and a lot of standing outside Parliament in the freezing cold mm-hmm. and doing all of that business, which, you know, which was great. And I was I was in a position where I was probably the most well I'd been in years. And I couldn't bear, I could literally could not bear the thought that there was anybody feeling as low as I felt and potentially thinking about, you know, knocking it all on the head and leaving this place because they were in pain that was unmanaged and that they weren't able to access this medicine or that, that, that they were too scared to access this medicine because of the law. So I just could not, I was like a dog with a bone. I just could not stop from that moment. Ooh. And actually thinking about it, I haven't really stopped yet. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so, um, thank you so much for sharing that. It's really candid and I think... You know, of all the things that I cover on on this podcast, hearing actual patient stories is really what what moves me, and I think I'm a lot of my audience as well. And really understanding the things that you're going through that take you to really realise that this can have a significant impact, positive impact on your life. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Patient stories are, and I think patient stories really that that's what has got has got us to this point. Like you think about Billy Caldwell, um, Alfie Dingley, you know, patient stories have really pushed this movement forward and so as hard as it is sometimes for patients to stand up and bear everything it really does move the needle yeah absolutely so you mentioned united patients alliance which is a fantastic patient advocacy group that that you work with and what are the other things that you're doing so i'm doing lot i'm doing lots of things at the minute so uh, i'm still a trustee on the board for the united patients alliance so i'm sort of helping them sort of reshape what's coming next because i guess uh, following the law change and following the um you know the fact that people are accessing cannabis on private prescription at the minute and the upa was set up to be a campaigning organization so i guess there's a bit of a need to to move things on to sort of reflect where we are now so that's so that's all happening mm-hmm. in the background, which is fantastic. And our aim really is to build some educational resources, and and alongside Gavin as well, who who I know you had on, who's another trustee. So there are two other sort of main projects I'm working on at the moment. One of which is a female-led collective, 
Um, so we really want to build um, awareness and education from the ground up for the consumer. So we're working on lots of different things to not only to be able to do that, but also to reduce stigma. So we have an our education lead who has written two amazing children's books about cannabis and hemp. Right. which and they are and and they're beautiful incredible um and that project is something that's really close to my heart because a lot of the um the patients that I deal with uh particularly the chronic pain patients actually are you know are women who you know that the industry you know the culture has been very male dominated and so there is a bit of a stigma about women utilizing cannabis in the first place but also Women are more likely to, you know, to have children or be, you know, sole carers for children. And there is a massive issue, uh, and we see it a lot in in women being able to to talk about why they're utilising cannabis or to use it as a medicine openly. Um, and a lot of that stigma sort of starts in the family. How am I going to be able to explain to my kids? What are they going to say at school? You know, what if they tell a teacher? You know, a lot of the legal implications sort of get dragged into the family space and that creates a, a stigma and a dynam- dynamic that means that a lot of the time women feel like they're having to keep it underground from their family and from the rest of the community mm-hmm. and so we wanted to to provide some resources to make it easier to have those conversations within a family unit so that's really exciting that project is is just about to take off we're going to do some crowdfunding for the illustrations we've got an amazing illustrator on board so yeah so that's that's sort of all happening in the background which is really exciting and we all you know we all utilize other plants as well so we're going to be doing some educational stuff around things like psilocybin you know use of psychedelics i myself use uh, psilocybin every fourth day which dramatically reduces my neuropathic pain and means i use less cannabis but yeah, so the, therap- the therapeutic benefits of that are massive and it's something that, you know, people aren't really talking about at the minute. So we, we're going to utilize that platform to do some of that as well as talking about cannabis. Yeah, um, very useful to, to understand it in relation to pain as well, because I think a lot of the new interest around psychedelics is, is more kind of mind based, I suppose. Well, if you think Dealing about anxiety and things like that. Yeah. But if you think about what it's doing in that it's sort of rebalancing the, the chemicals in your brain, a lot of those chemicals are, re, are are actively responsible for protecting the nerves anyway. So mm. what you're doing is you're giving the brain more, you're giving them those nerves more protection, which is why when it, you know, when it comes to neuropathic pain or like my pain, that's just kicking off left, right and center. It's something that is really helpful. And it, alongside cannabis is, you know, is far more beneficial and it has a, you know a brilliant side effect profile which as we know is just i'm in a better mood mm. when you compare it to the anti-neuropathics and the opiates so psilocybin and, and cannabis work for me really well in combination yeah yeah so th- so we have that we have that going on and that's and that's really cool the girls are fantastic girls it'd be great for you to meet them yes um and i suppose the other thing that we've got going on is the amnesty which was set up originally because I was unable to sustain my private prescription because it cost an arm, a leg, and both ears uh, yeah. for a month's supply. How much was it, if, if you don't mind me asking? It was 1,500 quid. Whoa. Yeah. A month, per month. A month, which is significant. And, we, and you know, we did some maths and worked out that, you know, we could gr- grow that amount for next to nothing, under 30 quid. Mm. Uh, you know once you'd sort of bought all of the tents and stuff the actual the actual um monthly cost once you whittle it down is is pretty much nothing so um you know i was because i was the first patient in the uk to access um cannabis on a private prescription i was just really aware that i had an army of people behind me that were just waiting to sort of do what i did Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what the reason I went and got a private prescription in the first place was to try and convert it then to an NHS prescription, which which was actually done. Um, yeah. My pain specialist did rewrite it as an NHS prescription, but it was blocked by the clinical commissioning group, who are the people who decide whether they're going to fund um, a special medicine. And they decided that there wasn't enough evidence for cannabis and pain. I roll um to you know to to sort of pay pay up 
Um, and I knew, and I think that, you know, I sort of knew that that was a risk and, it, you know, I could just go back to, to what I was doing before and accessing on the, on the black market, the illicit market. But I knew that there was some, I had to do something about this because I knew that there was going to be hundreds of people, thousands of people behind me in the same situation who aren't going to be able to sustain this. And so I, I went into the police station and said, I'm growing these plants. I'm going to grow the exact strains I was prescribed, the exact weight I was prescribed. Anything else will be destroyed. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm asking you sort of not to come and arrest me. And here's an idea for a patient register um, whereby if these pe- people qualify for a private prescription but can't afford it, there is another option for them to stop them from being criminalized because realistically mm. all that's stopping them from not being arrested is £1,500 a month and who sort of has that lying around. Yeah. And initially they did come to the house and they took the plants, but that was because I'd been parading them all over the telly. <laughs> <laughs> and the radio and this morning. But, I, you know... I, I sort of knew that that was that that was going to be the case, but the the copper that came round, bless her, she was really upset. She was in tears on the couch. I was making her a cup of tea, and I was sort of comforting her in a way. Yeah. She said, "I really don't want to take your plants," and I said, "Don't worry, like see these seeds. <laughs> as soon as you leave <laughs> that door, I'm going to plant these seeds in those pots." And she said, "Okay, I'll leave the pots." So she left. She just emptied the plants out into an evidence bag and left the pot. So they knew, you know, they knew I was going to yeah. go straight back to it. But what, you know, what happened after that was um, following that and a bit of press that we got after, you know, the police took my plants is that other police organisations and other police forces started to get in touch with me to to say that they would really support the scheme and, you know, we got the public backup of, you know, the police federation, the police foundation. You know, we had support from the National Police Chiefs Council. Then PCC started to come forward and, and say, you know, this is a great idea. And a lot of them have said that they want to run it in their constituency, which is cool. The only issue is that we need to get a slight we don't need to change the law in order to be able to do this. But what we need is either some national guidance issued by the director of public prosecutions to say, you're, you're cool to, to run with this pilot, um, or we need a slight except, exception to a law. So that, that, that's slightly different from a law change. So if you're, so for example, if you're carrying a massive knife through the city center in the middle of the day, you're probably going to get yourself nicked. But if you, you're carrying that same massive knife through that same city centre and you're a chef on your way to work, there's an exception in the law that says that's fine. Mm-hmm. You, can, mm-hmm. you can carry on with your knife. Um, and so that's the kind of amendment that we're looking for is an exception to allow um, patients who are who legally qualify for a private prescription the right to be able to grow their own cannabis. And almost would it be like you, you, you carry a card? That says I'm I'm exempt. Yeah, pretty much. So simple possession would be fine. Uh, there would be some. We, you know, we're not because the police systems are so heavily. You know, they're already so integrated into everything that they do. We have kept the detail quite vague so that we can sort of put it into those systems that make the most sense for the police or for the homeless mm-hmm. or whoever it is. Um, because, you know, we didn't want to introduce something that didn't fit with them. So, yeah, so it might be a card. It might be, you know, some kind of log online register. It could, you know, it could, it could work in lots of different ways. It could be something digital that's on your phone. You know, there are lots of ways in which we could do it. But, yeah, so that, you know, the first port of call is to try and get this national guidance issued. Yeah. Um, which how, are you, how are you progressing with that? Is it? Yeah, so there's a few other things going on at the moment. So. I know, I know, right? Yeah, around Corona. The thing about the legal work is that it's just really frustratingly slow. It's just like banging your head against a brick wall. Everything is so long winded, but it's you know it's going okay considering 
considering what we're trying to do is actually quite significant. Um, and so we're engaging now with the director of public prosecutions, who is, you know, he's going through everything to see if we can make this exemption work. Now, that would be great because we can sort of skirt around the political issues then. We don't, you know, we don't really, even though we've got a lot of support from Parliament and MPs, we sort of don't need them because the DPP has got enough leeway to make this happen without it being political. So it doesn't need to go through Parliament. It doesn't need to go, you know, it doesn't need to be put to a vote. Um, realistically, we can skirt around that, which would be the best option. And so the case that we're presenting at the moment is based on the fact that the law is not being applied in the same way throughout the country. So there's a bit of a postcode lottery at the moment. And there's a report that's just about to come out um, by, Vol- by Voltfass, who they've done a bit more of a, an in-depth geographical analysis of how the law is being applied in different places. And this is something that we already knew, but now there's sort of legitimate data to back it up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, a law, can, a law can really only be a law and be applied if it, if it is being, if that is the case across the board. Is enforced Why? consistently, yeah. Exactly. Otherwise, it, it doesn't really work. It's not really a law. Hmm. And so our, our legal argument has got a lot to do with that, which is great because we know that we we know that we have that argument in the bag. We know that it's not being applied consistently. Um, we know, for example, that Merseyside are one of the worst forces when we're talking about cannabis. They will take you to the cleaners for a tiny, tiny amount of simple possession. Whereas if you go sort of 20 miles down the road to Cheshire or even Greater Manchester, you know, they wouldn't look twice at you, you know, smoking a joint in the street. It's, you know, it's significant. And um, and it's not, you know, it's not fair to to consumers. It's not fair to, to people. It's not, it's not a fair law. It's not fair to the police that are having to enforce it. It's not fair to people in court. It's not fair to our resources. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's big implications really about the, the inconsistencies and, and the inconsistencies exist because they don't have any kind of formal guidance. It's just been sort of left to individual chief inspectors to decide whether they're going to prioritize or not. And so they've made their decisions based on, you know, their own bias. And that isn't the way that the law is set up to work. Yeah. And, you know, and that, and those bias are causing trauma and suffering for, particularly for, for medicinal cannabis patients who, you know, I get reports all the time, five in the morning, you know, dogs through the door, smash the door in, there's kids in the house, we're talking two plants, it's heavy handed, it's aggressive. It's 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 a it's a trauma point for the whole family, particularly when there's children involved. And I just I just can't sit back and let and let that happen to people that are, you know, trying to keep on top of their epileptic seizures. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, there's loads and loads of stuff there. First of all, thank you so much for doing this. It's so important and I love the sort of grown up approach you're taking to it, you know, in terms of engaging with the authorities on this and presenting a very compelling case. I guess the bit of frustration, as you say, is just the total inconsistency of how this is viewed and prosecuted, let's say, across the country. I mean, I read some things about some police forces being quite progressive in this area and and I'm sure you've dealt with some of those members of the police force who who are more supportive of what you're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. How are you finding that that mix up of different approaches? Well, it's really, you know, it's really different. Um, and these places can be quite close in, you know, geographically, but their attitudes and, their, you know, even their point of, you know, their willingness to engage with me is very different. Um, so we all, you know, we all know that Durham has got a really relaxed approach to cannabis, and that's thanks to the late Ron Hogg and also to Mike, Michael Fisher, who's an absolute champion in the space. Um, you know, and they have a, you know, a cannabis club operating on their high street in which people can just go in and buy their cannabis and, you know, have, have a, a vape while they're there and, and, and leave. And the police have completely endorsed that as a, you know, as a model that they, that they think is working. But then, you know, you, you sort of drive across the border to somewhere else and it's, you know, it's a very different, different story. And I think 
um, you know, uh, the majority of police and crime commissioners and chief constables have been quite quite happy to have a chat about it because I think that they they know at some level that this is affecting their staff. Others, however, uh, you know, won't you know won't have a bar of it, won't talk to me, and to to some extent, you know, that's fine. That's kind of the world that we live in. Everyone's got a very different view of, and particularly when it comes to drugs, it's it's such a a divisive topic. But you know, all of the the latest research that we've got sort of goes against the idea that it is acceptable, you know, to to prosecute people with you know with any kind of drug possession um we know that it you know it limits people's life options after afterwards we know that it doesn't stop the you know any kind of problematic drug use that might be there we know that it you know that it just drains resources and that you know there isn't much a positive impact on the community we we know that the war on drugs is 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 bullshit basically and i think a lot of a lot of the you know the higher ups in the police do know that themselves. There's a couple that are in denial and that are still strongly, you know, no, say no to drugs and, you know, are still sort of preaching that war on drug attitude, which is is really destructive and it's horrible. So, it's, you know, that's the reason why when we talked about doing pilot schemes in some places that would have been geared up to to sort of roll with the amnesty, is that I wasn't really happy about having those geographical areas butted up to to places where they were less likely to to embrace it because you know then then you're just creating an unfair system within an unfair system yeah also then you have the issue of you know if you need to cross the road into another town you know and you you're, you're taking your vaporizer with you is that chief constable going to be as nice as your chief constable which is letting you know who's letting you grow so many plants at home so then you have like almost like the states you almost have a, a border yeah um yeah. And, and that felt really wrong which is why i've sort of persevered with trying to get some national some national guidance and actually the the cps have have been really supportive of the work that we're doing and you know are pretty much backing the scheme or the idea of the scheme which is really yeah. unheard of and that was actually a bit of a shock well done that's so that's great news yeah but i think i you know i think their resources are also being drained by this and you know and people aren't daft people aren't going to buy that this is acceptable for much longer i don't think yeah you, you'd hope um but then you know we've got a home secretary who's demonstrating certain <laughs> fingers in ears qualities and is seemingly very out of touch with <laughs> reality. But let's not get too political there. Okay, so that, I mean, look, there's that's on the advocacy side. That's amazing, and that's some really, really powerful work that you're doing. And I'm, well, I'm sure lots of people are really glad that you're doing it. And we wish you all the best in in terms of that. If, if you don't mind, maybe we can talk a bit more about you on a personal level in terms of the bits that you talked about right at the beginning around experimentation. And that, you know, you, given your personality, went with it with with some gusto in terms of trying to evaluate all different types of... You were like a one-person patient study, basically. Yeah. What were the results? What were the results? <laughs> what did, yeah, what did you find out? Um, so I found out that CBD doesn't really touch the sides for me. Um, and I, 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 understand, I understand why. So I've talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, I I found out that you know there are some one to one strains that sort that sort of keep the pain quite low, but you know generally for me the high THC strains work much better, and that was one thing that I really had to work with the private doctor to help him understand from a sort of scientific point of view in terms of what's happening in the brain, because um, I think a lot of the information that they access online that pain specialists access online sort of say oh you know balance the strains one-to-ones you know the basic information that is without practical experience so he's not you know these people have not yet been in the business these private clinics they've not yet been in the business long enough to understand how to utilize this medicine properly but also they haven't been advocating for patients and seeing these stories come through so they don't have the anecdotal stuff to support really their clinical decisions at the moment it's a bit of a stab in the dark so he's one-to-one like a kind of safe bet 
type thing. Yeah, one-to-one, I think, is kind of for the doctors who are like, I sort of think that cannabis might help you, but I'm not willing to, you know, to give to give you high THC. I think that they they feel it's a safer bet. I think that they think that it will reduce any symptoms of, you know, any potential mental health issues. Which to a certain extent they're right, but I don't it's not appropriate for everybody. A lot of, you know, a lot of MS patients, anecdotally, a lot of MS patients that have tried Sativex, you know, try Sativex once, it burns their mouth. It's one to one. They don't enjoy it. It doesn't help with their spasticity, and they go back to the, the the criminal market. You know that is a story that we hear constantly. It goes round and round and round again. Another MS patient that doesn't rate Sativex. It's it, you know. So yeah. So I found that mostly high THC was was where it was at for me, and then it was about sort of trying to work out what combination of terpenes or you know what strain types suited me. And so at the moment, I'm still sort of utilizing the similar strains as to what I did, you know, at at the end of those results. So if, you know, if I could pick, I would have uh, Jack Herrera in the daytime because I find Jack really incredible for the muscles, for spasticity. It keeps on top of the nerve pain. It's not particularly intoxicating. The combination of terpenes just, just seems to work really well. And it keep it can keep me pain free in the daytime, so that I don't have to you know hit a heavier strain. Yeah. But sometimes I do have to bring in sort of a strain with more indica type terpenes in the daytime if my spasticity is really bad. So I have a you know I have a condition called uh, dystonia, which which means that I sort of cramp up and sort of go into a statue. Everything sort of like cramps up, tenses up, and I can get stuck like that. Um, and so I, I would favor more of a sort of more of an earthy indica strain um, to bring that down because it, it just it, it works quicker. Um, and so in the evenings and for really severe dystonic episodes, I tend to go for something like a Northern Lights. Um, I find that those combinations of terpenes really, really heavy and helpful. So it really just melts all of your muscles and brings down some of that um, that cramping and that spasticity in the body. But, you know, there are, you know, maybe 50 or so strains that work for my pain. It's just that some of them are better than others. Some of them I would prefer over others, and I would say they're my favourite. Yeah. And then and have you experimented with different methods of ingestion as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've tried, I, I think I've probably tried everything now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and 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 what was did you what did you find out from that? Is it is smoking your preferred approach? Um, so no, actually, vaporizing is is probably my my preferred. Inhalation is is great for chronic pain patients because it it you know it gets to where it needs to go really quick. There's no messing about waiting for oils to kick in or sublingual drops to be absorbed. It's not you know there's no mess. There's no fuss. Um, it's just like breathing in and out and then you're, you know, then you're not in pain shortly after that. And so uh, we find, uh, anecdotally that a lot of, uh, chronic pain patients prefer to vaporize or inhale in some way that, that, that might be smoke for some people. I, I find that I do, st- I, I, I only go to combustion when, uh, vaporizing at high temp isn't cutting it for the dystonia. So there are times where I can be really, really cramped up and stuck in a shape um, and I've vaporized and vaporized and vaporized at a high temperature. That might not cut it, and then I might combust using a uh, using a, a water pipe or something. But generally, I stick to vaporizing. I find that capsules take too long when you're in really intense pain that 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 comes on quite suddenly. You want something as quick as possible, no fuss. Um, I find capsules take far too long to kick in, and I and and leave me quite groggy. And the same sort of with the sublingual drops it's a similar sort of story for me um right. i find it much easier to dose as well with vaporizers because you can have you can have like 10 inhales and then rest for a bit see how you're doing and then go back and take some more so I, you know that's why patients prefer it is because it's really flexible you can change the um the temperature to reflect you know what cannabinoids you want more of so if i want more cbd in my you know in my body then I'll I'll vaporize at a lower temperature. If I want more THC CBN, then I'll I'll whack it right up. 
so you can you know it's the most flexible form of of medication and um i find it works best for me and and the next level down have you do you notice a difference between when you've ate dry flour versus oils yeah so I, i tend to get more of a relaxation in my muscles and my body if i when i use flour if I use concentrates, I tend to experience the mood lift and some reduction in neuropathic pain, but it isn't quite as good for the muscles. That might be a temperature thing. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not even sure how or why that is. But I, you know, maybe some entourage going on there. Yeah, um, you know, whole plant versus just an extract. Yeah, it's it's very complex, isn't it? And you know, um, the more kind of scientists I speak to, the more they're very honest about the fact that we really are very, very early stages of understanding a lot of this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Some, I mean, some of the things I can understand, or I can, you know, throughout my experience, I can piece together with the bits of science that I do know. But others, I'm, I'm like, I don't know why or how, or or, and I think it's fine to to sort of not know. I I mean, I don't, Yeah. yeah. You know, we're not- well, this is why this is why this this kind of evolution of this form of medicine is is really interesting because it's it's going to be a bit more based on the anecdotal evidence of things that are actually working because to you know to RCT four hundred different variables is is insane and uh, you know a huge task. So we need to kind of think in a different way. I think. Yeah, I mean, the cannabis and RCTs, it's never, that's never going to happen. It's like some squeezing something, even if we take one strain that has a hundred and so compounds and we're trying to fit it into a box that was made for a single compound medicine, it just doesn't work. It's like fitting a car into a cereal bowl. It's never going to happen. It's just like, it's never going to happen. And that, you know, and, and there's a lack of understanding in the, you know, in the community that represents the NHS and in the, you know, those sort of higher up medical officers who who don't seem to understand that that isn't going to happen, that it's not going to work, you know. And then once you've taken one strain through five years of RCTs, then you've still got, you know, one thousand four hundred and ninety nine other strains to do. So, yeah. so yeah. you know, we're, yeah. it's going to be nine hundred years before we can even get, you know, before we can even get these things prescribed. I don't. I, it's a system that it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, as you, as you mentioned, it's a kind of binary approach to it for those that don't really understand cannabis gets you high and that's it. Yeah. Right? And there's no nuance to it in that it can, you know, cannabis, cannabis can be lots of different types of plant and with different effects and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, there is there's a lot of education. And I, I, I always, you know, when I speak about cannabis and we talk about cannabis, I always assume that there's that this base level of knowledge and quite a lot of the time there really isn't. Yeah. Um, and so you really have to deep dive right back to basics, even when you're talking to people that really should know, you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, like prescribing clinicians, for example, or, you know, people that are really in this space. And, you know, there is, there's a really... There's a chunk of this basic knowledge that, that just isn't there, doesn't exist. And, and for people like me and you and anybody else that talks about cannabis or is in this space 24 hours a day, we sort of have this massive uh, array of knowledge. And sometimes it's really easy to forget that you really have to drop down to do the basic stuff with people who who you, you sort of assume know, you know, what, you know, what a cannabinoid is. <laughs> yeah. You know. yeah 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 there's lots to learn for everyone i think so listen when we could talk for ages and actually i'm already thinking about the next show i get you on for but um my traditional last question which i maybe have to alter slightly is what did your parents say when you told them that you were getting into cannabis i guess yours is a slightly different story because it's obviously intrinsically linked to your health but was that a difficult conversation or? Um, no. So I don't really, I, I don't really see my dad, but my mom is, my mom is a very floaty hippie. Like she, she just floats about doing like a bit of African drumming or, or something, you know, you know, you never really know what you're getting with my mom. So, so actually I think my mom was just quite keen on trying it and has, has ever since been on oil that I make and, 
you know, now right. she's microdosing psilocybin. She's writing a book about it. So uh, that conversation for me was quite easy, actually. Yeah. Wider family? Did you? Yeah. No, I mean. Because yeah, I guess there's a difference between doing it for yourself and then taking such a proactive public facing role as you have. Mm. Um, I think my other yeah. half has struggled with having the press in the house. And I think that's been it's been difficult to deal with with being in the public eye and you know trolls and all all of those kind of things were sort of a bit more problematic than than um me deciding to to utilize cannabis. I think a lot of my friends and family just immediately saw what the difference was and then were just really excited about it. Um because you know, bless them, they've you know, they'd been through years of seeing me sort of lose uh, lose the person that I was and they they just seemed really excited to have me back really um, and so I couldn't really have had a better time with telling my family and and you know and having that support but I, I am aware that that isn't always the case and I'm you know I do support people who have had a really horrible time in telling their families and you know the work that we're doing with Planted should hopefully reduce some of those stigmas so that people can have more open conversations about cannabis from a point of, of, of proper knowledge and, and, you know, really from really understanding this plant and not from whatever it is that they've read in the Daily Bloody Mail. Mm, yes, the perfect way to end this episode. Yes, I can agree with you more. And, yeah, I'm glad that that went well for you. But you're right to acknowledge the fact that it's not always an easy conversation with, with lots of people. But um, Carly, thank you so much for sparing the time today. And I'm a huge fan and supporter of everything you're doing. So we'd love to have you back on at um, another point. Hopefully we could talk about the, the DPP giving some clear guidance in this area. Yeah, let's hope for that. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Carly. Oh, thanks care. so much, love. Take care. Cheers.